Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I want to cover a recent blog post by Terry Smith of Fund Smith. Now, Terry Smith used to be a top-rated analyst in the banking sector, okay? And he just wrote a blog post, Why I Never Invest in Bank Shares. Now, when I see what's happening in the banking sector, right, there's blood in the streets. I'm like, ah, oh, I got to get in this thing, right? I got to get involved somehow. I'm hoping to cure that impulse today uh, with this blog post by Terry Smith. For those of you whose impulse is not cured by this blog post, uh, there's a few resources recently that I'd like to share on the banking sector that I, I thought were particularly noteworthy. So let's work our way through this blog post. Why does Terry Smith never invest in banks? Having spent the first decade of my career working in a bank and then becoming a top-rated bank analyst, I find that people often express surprise that I never invest in banks. But I think it is precisely because I understand banks that I never invest in their shares. The recent events surrounding the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse reinforce this stance. Why? Firstly, I never invest in anything that requires leverage to make an adequate return. Banks have a very small amount of equity to support their balance sheet. Here are the actual numbers for NatWest Group for 2022. To make it easier to understand, I have reduced them to percentages. So the big thing here, equity, 5%. Okay, NatWest has... Five pounds of shareholders' equity to fund 100 pounds of assets. It has a gearing or leverage of 20 times. If 10% of the 52 pounds of loans in every 100 pounds of assets prove to be bad, then the whole of the shareholders' equity is more than wiped out. Okay. Frankly, long before that happens, depositors are likely to spot the problem and panic and cause a run on the bank, as we saw with Silicon Valley Bank. Nor are these circumstances unimaginable. Author Nassim Taleb, in his book The Black Swan, points out that in the 1982 Latin American debt crisis, the large American banks lost all of their cumulative past earnings. In contrast, the average company in the S&P 500 index has 26 billion of assets and 8.5 billion of equity. They are on average geared two times. Falls in asset value are not their main risk, but their assets would have to fall by one third in value to lose the value of their equity. So that's uh, contrasted with 10% for this NatWest example. So 10% versus 33%, it's a big difference. Uh, next, despite this massive leverage and the risk which accompanies it, returns from the banking sector are inadequate. Uh, Terry Smith in his annual presentation talks a lot about different sectors and, and what kind of returns on capital are for those different sectors. Uh, the average return on equity in the S&P banks sector over the past five years is just, just shy of 11%. This compares with return on equity on the S&P consumer staples sector over the same period, nearly 18%. These poor fundamental returns unsurprisingly translate into poor share price performance. Um, the total return on the S&P banks sector over the past five years was minus 15% per year, whereas consumer staples returned positive 12%. So much for the theory that you need to take more risk to get higher returns. Finally, surely there must be some good banks to invest in which are better than the average. That brings me on to another problem, systemic risk. Even if the bank you are invested in is well run, it can still be damaged or destroyed by a general panic in the sector. There is an anecdote which illustrates this. In the early 1980s, doubts first set in about the future of Hong Kong 
with the looming handover of control to China, and a crisis soon developed in the property sector which provided the collateral for much bank lending. In the midst of this, there was a local bank which had an awning open over its front window to keep the sun out. It was by a bus stop, and as heavy rain shower developed, the bus queue moved to take shelter under the awning in front of the bank. In the febrile atmosphere, passersby thought this was the beginning of a bank run, and as a result, one soon developed. That's banking for you. Banks can be brought down by the actions of their peers. Look at what happened to some U.S. regional banks in the wake of the Silicon Valley Bank disaster. Lord Mervyn King, the former Bank of England governor, encapsulated this when he observed that it made no sense to start a bank, a run on a bank, but once one has started, you should join in, okay, which is exactly what we saw with Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, that encompasses my long-standing reasons for avoiding bank shares, but another has emerged in recent years, fintech. What are the essential functions of a bank? To take deposits, make loans, and effect payments. All of these essential roles are now being su supplanted by so-called fintechs. Bank loans are being replaced by peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms and credit funds. You don't need a bank for payments or deposits. You can get your salary paid straight into your MasterCard or Visa account, and they are far better at payment processing, for which you can also use your Apple or Android phone. Technology is supplanting traditional banking. Have you noticed that your local bank branch has become a Pizza Express? In which role, by the way, it makes more money. Not only that, but the banks are often handicapped by legacy systems which do not trouble new entrants. And at least until recently, fintech startups enjoyed a seemingly endless supply of funding with little or no requirement to show a profit. As Paul Volcker, the infamous former chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, said, the only innovation of any consequence by the banking sector in the 20 years running up to the global financial crisis was the ATM, and we don't even need those anymore. So this is what Terry Smith has to say about the banking sector. Now, if that hasn't cured you of wanting to invest in banks, uh, this conversation with Francois Rochon of Giverny Capital, uh, he mentions he owns four or five banks, which is the most Giverny has ever owned uh, in, I think, about 25 years of running that fund. Uh, and he, Francois did mention in here, he doesn't invest in banks. He invests in bankers, okay? Um, so there are great bankers. Um, and John Maxfield gets into this as well. This is a, a fantastic hour-long kind of exploration about investing in banks in a post-Silicon Valley bank world. Uh, and he highlights th this same fact. Here's what he says about banking. Banking is a business of abundance, okay? Uh, it's about managing abundance. Now, managing abundance requires a different set of skills than managing scarcity, Okay, most businesses are managing scarcity. Not true of banking. Um, the underlying variable that allows someone to succeed in an environment where managing abundance is the primary constraint. Okay, the innate or acquired immunity to greed and envy. Okay, a banker really needs to have that innate or acquired immunity to greed or envy. I imagine that's a very small subset of bank CEOs that have that characteristic, that immunity. Um, so where John Maxfield is really going with this, you must assess who's running the banks, okay? That's, that's the big X factor when you're trying to figure out what bank might be a good investment. 
Um, who's running it? Who, who are the managers behind that bank? Uh, he says, the banks I like the most are the banks with the best people that run them. He mentions four different banks in this podcast. Uh, he mentions Patrick Gaugan at HIFS, Hingham, which is pretty popular in value circles these days. Uh, Hingham, half a billion market cap bank. Uh, Aaron Graft at Triumph Financial, T-F-I-N. Uh, just over a billion market cap, 1.3 billion, so still small cap. Uh, Brent Beardall at Washington Federal, which is W-A-F-D, just shy of 2 billion market cap. And then Scott Dozer at F-F-I-N, which is First Financial Bank Shares. A little bit bigger, nearly 5 billion, so right in the, the mid-cap territory. So, you know, if I were thinking of getting into the banking sector, right, uh, I'd be looking at what Giverny Capital owns in terms of banks. So you've got M&T, Bank Corp, uh, Bank of America, First Republic. Whew, that, that's one that's gotten a lot of airtime recently. Uh, Bank OZK. This is a favorite of Phil Towns. Uh, I think near the near the top of his portfolio, uh, and then we're really getting down to some of the smaller holdings here. Um, yeah, so those are a couple that Francois owns, and then like I said, HIFS, TFIN, WAFD, or FFIN. But to be honest, guys, I I'm not going to be looking into any of these. I'm very happy to be on the sidelines, at least. Uh, for the banking sector. Uh, but hopefully this gave you guys some food for thought in terms of should I, you know, get in here when there's blood in the streets? Should I just avoid this this sector entirely? Um, certainly there's a case to be made on, on both sides here. Uh, Terry Smith s stays away, even though he has very deep knowledge of the sector, perhaps because he has very deep knowledge of the sector. Uh, and then, you know, here's two guys who are invested in the banking sector and very focused on, you know, betting on the banker, not the bank. So hopefully that gives you guys something to, uh, to chew on. It's, it's a very interesting time, to say the least, in banks. I can't... When, when's the last time there was a run on a bank? in the US, right? It seems like it's been a very long time. So history in the making. All right, guys, that's all I have for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.